Now, good afternoon folks, you are all very welcome to the Rock of Cashel. My name is Magella and I'll be your tour guide for the next 35 to 40 minutes. Now before we start the tour, I do have a brief safety announcement. Now some of the doorways are a little bit low. Now this doesn't pose a problem for me, but if you are slightly taller, just be careful as you're entering some of the buildings. As well as that, some of the pathways are a little bit uneven in the graveyard, so just be careful in certain areas. Now before I talk about any of the buildings on site, I'd just like to give you a brief overview of the history of the Rock of Cashel. Now the history of the site here stretches right back to the 4th and 5th centuries, when it was originally the seat of the kings of Munster. Now I don't know how familiar some of you will be with Irish geography, but Ireland as a country is divided into four provinces, Ulster in the north, Leinster in the east, Connacht in the west and Munster here in the south. And this was basically the seat of power for this province. Now at that time, Ireland would have been ruled by what are known as clans or tribes. And the first clan to be associated with the site was the Oana clan and their family name was McCarthy. The first king who founded the kingship here at Cashel, his name was Conal Kirk. Now the McCarthys reigned here in power for over 500 years until they were ousted from power by another clan called the Dalcosh who came from County Clare and their family name was O'Brien. And one of its members was perhaps one of the most famous High Kings of Ireland and his name was Brian Guru. Now he became King of Munster in 978 and he became High King over all of Ireland in 1002 and he was the first Munster King to achieve this. He was killed at the Battle of Clontarf in 1014 when the Irish defeated the Vikings. Now it was his great grandson Murtaugh O'Brien who was to change the history of the Rock of Cashel forever because at a meeting here in 1101 he handed the site over to the church. Now this may seem like a very strange thing to do but at the time it was a very clever political manoeuvre. The church in Ireland at that time was gaining huge power. So to ensure his place within this power, he gave the site to the church and he also made sure that his family's old enemies, the McCarthys, could never again regain power because he had given away their ancient royal seat. So at that point, the site went from a site of political power to a site of religious power. And what we have here today are the remains of a collection of religious buildings that were built at different stages. None of the buildings that would have been here in the time of the kings exist today. Now the earliest buildings date to the 12th century, which is the round tower that's located on the opposite side of the site, and Cormac's Chapel, which is the building with the distinctive yellow stone you may have noticed as you come up the hill. Now some of you may already have been on the tour of the chapel at two, some of you may be going at three, but usually for those of you who have paid the general admission, I will be finishing the tour outside the chapel and explaining as much as I can about its significance from the exterior. Now we've one 13th century building, which is the cathedral that's located opposite us here, and we have two 15th century buildings, which is the tower house that was added to the back of the cathedral. It's where the archbishop would have lived when he lived on site, and the building we're standing in now, which is called the Hall of the Vicar's Choral, and this is where the choir would originally have lived. Now the site here continued as a religious site right up until the 18th century. And it was also the seat of an archbishop and it still remains an archdiocese today, the Archdiocese of Cashel and Emily. But over time, it got very difficult and very expensive for the town of Cashel to maintain a site like this. So it was decided that cathedral status would be put on St. John's in the town. And it was also decided that the archbishop would have a new residence in the town. And he lived in what is now known today as the Cashel Palace Hotel, which is located on the main street of Cashel. It's quite a distinctive building in the centre of the town and at the moment it's undergoing extensive refurbishment. Now at that point the site here was basically abandoned and it was left to rack and ruin and this continued right up until the 19th century when it was decided that important religious ruins like the Rock of Cashel would be taken into state care. This became one of the first national monuments we would have had in Ireland. It's the first monument that had any kind of conservation work carried out and this was done in the 19th century. Now we're starting our tour in the upper level of the Vicar's Quarrel. Now this building was constructed in 1420 by Archbishop Richard O'Heaton to house a group known as the Vicar's Quarrel. 
And this was basically the choir that would have sang in the cathedral during the ceremonies. Now buildings like this were fairly common in England and France, but this is the only one of its type in Ireland, so it makes it very unique. Now the Vicar's Choral were quite a select group, a group of only eight members, all male, a mixture of clergy and laity. And they were considered very important within the town of Cashel. They were given titles and lands by the Archbishop. Now the lay members who were part of the choir, if they were married or if they had families, their families lived in the town of Cashel. They did not live up here with the choir. Now the layout of the building where we're standing here would have been their living and dining room area. The smaller room that you would have passed through out there would originally have been their kitchen area. Downstairs where our museum section is, where the original St. Patrick's Cross is, would have been a storage area. And they would have slept in the room to the back of us here where our AV theatre is today. That would originally have been their dormitory. Now above the fireplace here, we have what is known as the seal of the Vicar's Choral. Now you'll see the members of the choir are represented there. Now this is a reproduction of the original seals. Now the original seals were much smaller. They were only as big as the palm of your hand. And they worked in the same way as a credit card would today. Now if any of the group needed to buy anything or if they needed to purchase anything within the town, they would present the seal and the bill would be sent to the Archbishop at the end of the year. Now with any system like this, it was said that it had been abused. Members of the group tended to give copies of the seals to their families and friends. So one year when the Archbishop got the bill, he got a bit of a shock. But it is one of the earliest cases of credit card fraud we would have had in Ireland. So for the sake of the Archbishop, the system was then changed after that. Now below the seal, we have the fireplace, which is original to this building. And you'll see there's an inscription here on the left hand side. Now the E here and the E here represent Edward or Edmund, which were fairly common names at the time. The S represents Saul and the H, Hackish or Hayden. Now the inscription in its entirety reads, Edmund Saul and Edmund Hackett had me made. Now at the time it was very usual for stonemasons to sign or signature their work, basically to differentiate themselves from any other craftsmen. Now stonemason's marks are fairly common in buildings of this type. They're not necessarily words, sometimes they're pictures or symbols. And you will see them in a lot of buildings of the period. Now all of the furniture that you see here is 16th century. It was purchased at an auction in a dear manor in County Limerick. And it's meant to be representative of what would originally have been here. The designs would have been fairly similar. The tapestry is 17th century and it's Flemish in origin and it's meant to represent King Solomon meeting the Queen of Sheba. Now tapestries were not only for decoration but they also provided heat and insulation to rooms because as you can imagine buildings of this type would have been very very cold. Now there was a belief back then that only God could create something perfect so it's very usual for weavers to deliberately put mistakes into their tapestries. Now some of the mistakes that have been identified, if you look at the lady at the end here, she's got quite a six pack for a woman, she's got a very mu <laughs> and muscular torso. The hands are also slightly unusual, the two of the figures are stuck, are stuck together, the one that the king is holding towards himself and also the one extended by the queen. Now the border also does not come the whole way around the tapestry. Now this could be because it might be part of a larger tapestry. Sometimes what we see hanging on castle walls and buildings like this today, sometimes was part of a much larger piece. Mm. Now above the tapestry, there's an inscription with the year 1982. Now this is the only restored building on site and it was restored between 1975 and 1982. Now while you were down in reception where you purchased your ticket, if you'd looked up at the roof, you would have seen carvings of stone heads. Now these are not historical figures associated with the site. These are people who were responsible for the restoration of this building. And their heads were carved up there to demonstrate how you would be recognized in the 15th century if you donated time, money, or expertise to buildings of this type. Now every effort was made to make this as accurate a restoration as possible. Now the walls that you see are original. The white color that you see on the walls is a white line wash and it was designed to reflect as much light as possible into the room. It also served, served to limit the growth of mold or damp 
because buildings of this type would have been very, very wet. Now the roof needed to be restored. Now there is not one nail holding this roof together. It's held together by wooden pegs which are known as dowel rods. All of the colours that you see there, they're all natural colours. They're derived from plant dyes and again, it's very similar to what they would have had during this period. Now the carvings of the angels represent the fact that this was a choir house and they're holding different coats of arms of different archbishops who would have been here at certain points. Now as with all roofs of the 15th century, there is said to be a Viking or Scandinavian influence in this roof, which the craftsmen have endeavoured to create. Because it said, if you could imagine, if the roof was turned the other way, it looks like the inside of a Viking ship. Now folks, we're going to exit from the right hand side here and we're going to stop briefly at St. Patrick's Cross. Now the cross that you see there is the replica of St. Patrick's Cross that dates to the 12th century. Now the original can be found downstairs in the museum. Now the cross itself was built in memory of the visit of St. Patrick to the site in the 4th century. It differs from a lot of crosses of the period. I'm sure as you've travelled through Ireland and as you walk through the graveyard here today you will see the Celtic cross with the circular head on top. This is slightly different. It's what's known as a Latin style cross. It has a support on one side, it also would originally have had a support on the other. On this side is a carving of Christ, or on this side is a carving of a priest or an abbot, said to be a representation of St. Patrick, and on the, ba the other side is a carving of Christ in a full length roll. Now the base stone of the cross, some people originally believed that this was the coronation stone of the kings of Munster. But there is a lot of debate about this because it was thought it was more likely that the cross was all quarried in one piece. Now, when they moved the cross inside in the 1980s, they discovered the base of the cross was actually hollowed out. And you'll see this on the original inside because we have a mirror and a light underneath that reflects the hollowed out base. Now, it said it could have been hollowed out to make it lighter to move because if they hollowed out the base, it would make it lighter to transport. It was also said that while the clergy would have lived here, they may have used the base of the cross to hide anything valuable or anything they wanted to protect. Now there are a few myths and legends about the cross here. It is said that if you put your arms around the center piece of the cross and your fingers meet on the other side, you will never again get a toothache. It's also said if you hop around the cross nine times in an anti-clockwise direction, you'll be married within the year. Now if that's an urgent concern for anyone, feel free to try it. But remember, it's not the original cross, so we don't take any responsibility if these things don't work out. Now it is called St. Patrick's Cross and another name for the Rock of Cashel is St. Patrick's Rock. Now St. Patrick came to Ireland in the 4th century to convert the natives to Christianity and it was said that during this period he came to baptise the sons of Conal Kirk, the first king who would have had the Munster kingship here at Cashel. Now while he was baptising King Angus it was said that by accident St. Patrick actually stabbed the crozier or the staff that he carried through the foot of King Angus who he was baptising. Instead of yelling in pain, as you think he would have done at this point, King Angus actually thought this was part of the ceremony and he suffered in silence. So I don't think there were a lot of people volunteering to be baptised after that. But it is the only story that we have linking him here to the site. And it is widely believed he would have visited here because it would have been a hugely significant site in Ireland at that time. Now the reason the original cross was put inside, was moved inside, is because it was made from sandstone. And sandstone is not a very hard wearing rock. And as you can see from the replica here, originally it stood in a very exposed position. So the cross itself was not faring that well against the elements. So for its protection and conservation, it was bought inside in the 1980s when that building was restored and a limestone replica was made and put in its original position here. Now folks, we're going to go around this way and we're going to go to the earliest building in place.
through the graveyard here today, you will notice that some of the graves are quite new. Now people are still being buried on site here today, but there are very strict guidelines as to who can be buried here. Now in the 1930s, there was a view to closing the graveyard because we were not that suitable as a graveyard. We were built on solid rock and some of the graves were very shallow. But there was objection before this, this was done from people from the town of Cashel who had loved ones buried up here because they wanted their right to be buried up here with their loved ones. Mm. So a compromise was reached and a register was opened in 1930 and it is only the people on the register that can be buried on site. Now there are about nine or ten names left on this register and once these people are buried here that will be it. The register will be closed and there'll be no more burials on the Rock of Cashel. Now one of the most notable tombs on site is the one that you can see at the wall there. Now this is the tomb of the Scully family, a very wealthy family within Cashel. Now although it is very large, it's a portion of what it was originally like. Now this was struck by lightning in 1976 and two or three large portions broke off it and they're still to the back of the monument today. Now no effort has ever been made to restore it. All of the graves that you see here, these are all private family graves and they cannot be touched by the Office of Public Works who look after the buildings themselves. Now we've come to the earliest building on site, which is the Round Tower. It's been dated to 1101 to when the site was handed over to the church. There was a theory that it could have been built by Murtagh O'Brien to commemorate this event. Now Round Towers were fairly common in Ireland between the 10th and 12th centuries and they were usually associated with religious or monastic sites. Now if you've seen one round tower in Ireland, you've basically seen them all, they're fairly similar. But this is one of the most complete that you will find. It is 27 metres in height. It still has its conical shaped top. Now there is a lot of debate as to what a round tower could have been used for. Now some people believe that it could have been used as a place of storage because the doorway is very high off the ground, very difficult for animals or anybody to break into if there was something stored inside. It's also said it could have been used as a place of refuge if the site was under attack. Because again, the doorway is very high off ground. All you'd have to do is climb up the ladder, pull the ladder up and you would be safe. But there's a lot of debate about this because the interior of the round tower was made completely of wood. So all you'd have to do is like the base and the whole thing would grow up in smoke. So it wouldn't offer much protection in that instance. But the most agreed use of a round tower is actually as a freestanding bell tower. Now, Round Tower in, Ir in Irish or Gaelic is Clugchap, but if you translate it directly back to English, it means Bell Tower. And there are four windows that face north, south, east and west, and that's very typical of what a Bell Tower would have been like. Now, not only would there have been a lot of ceremonies held here, but there also would have been a lot of manuscripts, a lot of important information that would have been kept on site. And it was said that the Round Tower had a symbolic purpose to mark it as a place of prayer and as a place of learning because indeed it is one of the most visible buildings on site. Now folks, we're going to continue around the path here and we're just going to stop going to have a look at the Abbey before we go into the kitchen floor. The abbey that you can see from the site here, this is a 13th century Cistercian abbey and it was built around the same time as the cathedral. Now one of the archbishops who was involved in the construction of the cathedral, his name was Archbishop McCarwell, he was a Cistercian archbishop and he ordered the building of the abbey in the fields. Now it is open to the public, there's no guide service down there but you're welcome to wander it at will. As you're going down the hill from the site here, there's a little black swing gate on the right hand side and if you follow the path onto the road, you'll be able to access the abbey from there. Now it's known locally as Hoare Abbey, and Hoare is a very old English word. It was used to describe a colour. They would call the first frost in winter the grey frost or the hoar frost. And the monks that lived down there wore grey tunics, so it was the home of the grey monks. Now on the 20th of May 2011, we did a very special visit. Queen Elizabeth II, on her first official visit to the Repub Republic of Ireland, visited the Rock of Cashel. Now she landed by helicopter in the field near the abbey there. 
She walked across the field. There was no getting around that, no matter who you were. She was driven up on site. She was shown St. Patrick's Cross. She was entertained by the choir from the local community school upstairs in the Vicar's Choral. And then she was shown artifacts relating to the site inside in the cathedral. Now, as you can imagine, this was a lot of work for us coming up to the visit. But it is a day that will go down in the history of the site. And I can imagine someone in my position, 100 years from now, telling a group such as yourselves about this visit. And we do have an exhibition downstairs in our museum section about the visit itself. So feel free to take a closer look at that after your tour. Now, folks, we're going to go into the cathedral here. And I'm just going to explain briefly about the cathedral. I know you're going to the chapel at three. Now folks, this is St. Patrick's Cathedral. It was built in the 13th century in the Gothic style of architecture. A little bit different from what you'll be looking at in Cormac's Chapel or what may you've, you may have already seen. Now, it replaced Cormac's Chapel as the main centre of worship on site. Now, some of the Gothic features are quite obvious as you walk in. You'll see the pointed arches over the doors and over the windows. And the ceilings are much higher, the roof is much higher. And the thinking behind this was to make you feel closer to God or closer to heaven. Now, the cathedral was built over a number of decades, between 1230 and 1270. And there were three archbishops involved in its construction. It began under Archbishop O'Brien. It was continued under Archbishop McKelly, who was a Dominican archbishop and responsible for the Dominican Abbey you'll find on your way into the town. And it was completed under Archbishop McCarwell, who was a Cistercian Archbishop and responsible for the Abbey you can see from the site here. Now the layout of the cathedral, the smaller area up to the first arch there is called the nave. It's where the main congregation would gathered. The longer area that we're standing in is called the choir. It's where the old would originally be. Now over here we have the north transept and this is the south transept. The central part of the cathedral is called the belfry and crossing and it's where the bell would originally have been. Now an unusual feature about the cathedral is the nave is very short. Usually the longest part of any cathedral is where the congregation gather. It was thought that it had to be built a little bit differently to situate itself between two buildings that were already here, the Round Tower and Cormac's Chapel, and the altar area had to face east. So it literally had to be built the opposite way. Now in the choir area, here. This is where the ceremony would have been carried out. The tall windows that you see there are called lancette windows. They're typical of the Gothic style. Now along the top of the lancette windows, the windows with the arches, these are called quatrify windows. Now they look a lot different from the outside of the building. They actually look like little flowers on the outside. So they were really more for decoration as opposed to having a functional purpose. Now the roof of the cathedral was a wooden roof. It was burned on two occasions. It was burned in the 14th century by the Earl of Kildare and it was also burned during the 1647 siege. Now during this period, the site was attacked by Lord Inchiquin on behalf of the English Parliament. And it was said that a lot of people from the town of Cashel were killed during the siege because they came to take refuge in the enclosed site. But the site is not built primarily for defence and once it was breached, the cathedral was burned and these people were killed. It was called the Massacre of Cashel. Now when the site was abandoned by the church in the 18th century and once the buildings were deconsecrated, everything of value was removed and it was the archbishop at the time made a decision to dismantle part of the roof and reuse some of the wood in the cathedral down the town. What remained of the roof would eventually have collapsed. Now he did this to avoid attacks that existed on roofs of this type because had he left the roof intact, he would have been liable for this tax regardless of the building being used. 
Now this is the altar area of the cathedral and it was said that the clergy would have entered onto the altar area through this doorway here. There is evidence to suggest that there would have been a side chapel there where they would have prepared for the ceremony. Along this wall here in the centre we have what looks to be steps. Now this is what is known as the sedilla, it's where the clergy would have sat at certain points during the ceremony. A little bit further on in the wall we have the arch which is known as the piscina, it's where the sacred vessels would have been washed. Now about halfway up the wall we have a distinct rectangular gap, this is what is known as a leper point. Now there was a leper hospital located not too far from Cashel and if you suffered from this condition you were segregated from the rest of the congregation. So you would have watched the ceremony through this gap in the wall from a gallery area provided. Now this arch in the wall is actually a tomb of an archbishop who would have been here at one point and his name was Muller McGrath. Now he was archbishop here for over 50 years and he lived till he was 100. Very unusual for someone in the 17th century but he had a knack for looking out for himself as I will explain. Now he began his career as a Catholic Archbishop but when the Protestant Church came to power he changed his religion and he became a Protestant. Now, as you can imagine it didn't make him very popular with his Catholic parishioners but it was said that he still maintained a Catholic parish in the north of Ireland where he was originally from. So he was basically playing both ends against the middle. Now there's an inscription on his tomb that reads here I may lay, here I may not lay. Now as I said he didn't make an awful lot of friends throughout his lifetime and there was a belief back then that if you were not punished in life you'd be punished in death for what you did. So he implied he wasn't buried here at all to protect his tomb inside the cathedral. But it is widely believed he would have been buried here because this is where he spent the majority of his career. Now he's also married twice and had nine children and McGrath is a very common name around here. I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but his nickname was the Scoundrel of Cashel. <laughs> so it really tells you a lot about this individual associated with the site. Now folks, I think we're at three o'clock and I know you've already, you, you, are yeah. you going to the chapel? You've already been to the chapel. Yeah. So I'm just going to show you where to go and my colleagues will take it from here then. And it was lovely to meet you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. the Carmuck's Chapel tour. Now to explain why it's a different uh, ticket price and so on, it's under protection and conservation order. It being made of sandstone. Now sandstone is this beautiful bright brown stone in contrast to limestone. It's lovely stone, quite hard, it's tough, it's got quartz, it's got silica, it's hard if you're a mason to use it, but sandstone doesn't like the Irish climate. So it's rained occasionally for the last thousand years in Ireland. Over those centuries the rain on the building, it fell, absorbed it in, kept it in and was not sustainable going forward to keep it that way. It had to act upon it. Ten years ago it was scaffolding and a roof over the entire structure. It was there for eight and a half years to dry it out first and foremost, which they did. Brought the roof down brick by brick, put it back on again the same place, hopefully, they did, with a new mortar, which will last a thousand more years, that's hope at least. So they dried it out, redid the roof, installed fans to extract damp air and bring in dry air going forward as well. So the building has been saved pretty much, but we will undo all that good work if we don't control the access going forward. Outside we can't control what's happening out here. It's fluctuating temperature, humidity all the time. Inside it's stable. The fans, the door being closed, keeps it stable, which means no condensation, no moisture traps inside there. So it's better for the building going forward. What it is, a 12th century Romanesque chapel. Now Romanesque just means the rounded arches, the European style. Previously in Ireland they built very small, simple, plain churches in this country. First in timber, then in stone. A picture here of one of them. This is called St. Macdara's Chapel on the west coast of Ireland off Galway, off Karna in Galway, this church <coughs> still stands like this. 10th century church, simple, ordinary, plain. A high pitched roof, Irish style, but not a very fancy church. A very simple, straightforward doorway, not like this. Simply a straight door, with a, a lintel over it like that. 
This picture is Tomb Graney in County Clare, a simple doorway, 10th century. Who walked through here once was Brian Boru himself. <coughs> it still stands there today, but it's pre-Romanesque, the simple plain style. This changes everything. What was happening was a man called McCarthy, first name Cormac, was on his travels around Europe and brought with him some artists who drew his journey and had this idea of putting a church like in Germany here, which they did. So from Regensburg, monks came from Germany and Regensburg to Ireland to fundraise for a church in Regensburg and built that church. Came back here in later years and built this one in the same way. The twin towers are influenced from Germany, from Regensburg. Again, picture of that as well, of that church in Regensburg. It looks just like this. That is it there. You can see that, folks. The twin towers of the church in Regensburg is like these twin towers right here. Also, this is the doorway of that church. It's behind a structure these days, but it's protected now. That's it there as well. And also, the cathedral in Spire. It's called Spire, Spire. Again, twin towers. So, a German style influence on this chapel here in Ireland. And a new style at this time in the country. In sandstone. Why sandstone? It stands out. It's a statement building of wealth power of influence and spiritually it's also a beacon of light against darkness as well a very inviting church to bring people in to the building over the doorway is an animal what might it be who wants to put forward a suggestion what it may be all kinds of answers i guess sometimes a hippopotamus is often mentioned they're scarce in tipperary i must say rhinoceros is also scarce in tipperary too but they're, they're around maybe you never know that's thought to be, would you someone say goat or bull? A bull would be the correct. Ox or a bull. Why would there be an ox or a bull over the door? Well, Saint Luke is a winged bull. And Saint Luke is the mason's saint. An artist too. Others would say that the New, sorry, the Old Testament, the Book of Kings, describes King Solomon's tomb. How it was built, what was on it? A bull and one doorway was on it too. So that may be represented here too, that way, possibly too. Now, we're going to go inside. I'll get my, you show your wristbands to my colleague Tom at the door. The yellow is the right colour for this time. So I'll lead the way in. So please come in and we continue on inside. In here, it's about 6.8 degrees centigrade. So that's measured by these machines overhead. These monitors are measuring that and also humidity. So right now, it's about 88% humidity in here, which isn't too bad for this chapel. It's not very well ventilated naturally. These fans were added in later on to help the, the air be extracted and brought in. So this fan brings air in as do fans take it away here and they're brought out from both the north tower to fans. That changes the air whenever it's, it's suitable to do so. So whenever it's outside it's drier, the air is brought in to here. It's all going forward. The data from these machines goes to Cambridge, England. It's live data and they watch this very closely, and they are the leaders in Europe in this kind of conservation work. So a chapel is what it is, a royal chapel. This is a nave, N-A-V-E, nave. It comes from navy, transportation. People coming here from an ordinary life are transported to a spiritual place. People who are here in this area are non-clergy. The clergy are in here, in the chancel, the holy area. This faces east, as we know. The sun rises in the east, comes in with more windows, the new dawn and the new day, Christ's resurrection in light every day. In they walk this door here, the clergy. This is the main door. Next door here, that door is the back door really, but this door here is the main door once was. This building is 1134. Next door is the cathedral, 1235 onwards. So for a hundred years, that door opened out onto the view of Rock of Cashel. Round tower was there, the cross was there. They come in this door of clergy, bringing in the body and blood of Christ on a plate, a loaf of bread and the wine. Walk down along the wall in procession, slowly, because a walkway is there, one can walk along the wall in this way. A path is there for them to do that. Next door, there's no wall over there, no walkway there. The archway and the chancel arch and the roof arch are not in centred, they're offset. And not aligned at all. To leave the access way on the wall for those to walk in. They keep also in this elaborate doorway here, the North Tower, 
in there, they keep Christ's body and blood as well. In the Bible, we are told that Christ's tomb was cut in stone. So a stone cut tower is appropriate for that as well. They bring it in here in procession. And in here they go to the chancel. We'll go there now as well, so please follow me up. So please come in, use all the space provided. Okay, please stand there. Please stay there. Now that's the choir. You must sing if you're there. I'm all just right. kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> People do. I got cost many times with that one. So please come in. Please come in and look up that way there. And this was over here. There you go. Thank you. Just to say that this entire area here was once fully painted in Christ's early life. So it's told in the New Testament. Chapter 2 of Matthew describes the three wise men's journey and onwards and so on, Christ's birth and so on and so forth. It was once told in imagery all overhead. For teaching, for the most part, the glory of God too, as well, of course. The paint came from Afghanistan, the blue, it's called Lapis Lazuli. The red came from Spain, it's called Vermilion. Expensive proposition, of course. So, hidden away for centuries with whitewash. The shirts changed its message away from imagery and back to the book, to read the book together and sing songs together. No more looking around at distractions, back to the word of God in the book. That was the key message to the people. So for no bad reason really, hidden away for centuries. <coughs> Unfortunately, the paint, the salt in the paint, became crystalline with the humidity in here, and the paint became very crumbly and all fell apart, unfortunately. So back in the 80s, we tried to do some work on this, bringing the whitewash away, unfortunately, or the paint with it. But in this quadrant here, a section is there which has King Herod and the three wise men in audience with him. It's called, of course, in the Bible again, and they are asking King Herod, where will the child be born? Of course, he doesn't actually know, luckily enough. And he asks them to go find out, and then tell him, but they don't tell them, of course. That, they know. that was once all overhead, as I said, for teaching really. Before, the Irish would use stone crosses for teaching. On them was scripture, in imagery. It was the antithetical Christ-like story. And then they used images like this, and then stained glass for the same reason, all for teaching. Overhead here are some strange creatures. What could they possibly be? Well, we think they're grotesques, pagan symbols. You could reasonably ask, why is there a pagan symbol in a Christian church? Well, it's very much a crossover church. The old and the new together going forward. So it looks to the future in terms of its style, looks to the past as well with these images to frighten away any evil spirit in the old faith. Perhaps if I'm a pagan walking in here thinking I shouldn't really be here, I see these and think, oh that's familiar to me, recognise that. Maybe it isn't that different after all being in here. Perhaps it's just an evolution of my own faith. You've got to stay a while, you've got to convert later on. It's trickery maybe as well, that's said too. Overhead here are humans. Who are these? Perhaps they're sponsors. They pay to be there, possibly. They're buying their salvation, of course. It's guaranteed. Say a mass in here, say a prayer for their soul. Hope they'll go to heaven. Absolutely, definitely. That was the way back in an insurance policy of a kind back in the day, we believe as well. So, now, any questions on any of that? Very well. Now, the floor under our feet is not, of course, the original floor, it's a timber floor. There used to be flagstones here, and then for years there was gravel here. The gravel would absorb moisture, that was a good thing, but it also retained the moisture, which is a bad thing. So they put in a timber floating floor, which allows air to go underneath circulating out, which is better for the building going forward as well. So we've seen a huge change in the last 10 years of the building. 10 years ago this was very much a very damp, humid environment, on the wall the green and black growth, all cleaned off now. So it's got the best chance going forward to have the best chance to survive. That's our aim, so it's protection, conservation of this special building. You'll see here and there now, perhaps one door like these, like a gable end, but a full church is here, it's actually only of this type, of this age. We move down again to this other end just down here. This structure here wasn't always in here. 
it's called it's their confidence. The word means flesh beauty. It was once of the cathedral. Brought you here in the 1870s, you do believe. But you can see this wall here is rebuilt behind. But brought in, it's being made of sandstone as well, and broken unfortunately. Now, the front of it here was a full panel once. It was two, some say dogs, some say snakes, intertwined with a figure of eight. If I finish it off, the figure of eight comes down like this. What is that? Well, the infinite, exactly, the eternal life of the person inside. It is called Hiberno Norse art. Hibernia is Ireland to the Romans. They never really conquered the country, but they traded with Ireland, we know. So perhaps we were bringing in some wine and some olive oil, and we were sending out some timber and some animals, maybe. But there was trade going on with the Emperor of Rome. Called Hibernia, land of eternal winter. It's Ireland to the Romans. They called England Britannia, called Wales Cambria, and Scotland Caledonia. But Hiberno, Irish, Norse, Viking art, after a place in Norway called Arnes. You see there, the church is there too, with the same style, intertwining beasts like that. Now, why is that here? Well, of course, the Vikings were here around one thing for centuries. Now, there always been a bad press, aren't they? In TV and film and media, there were barbarians and savages and murderers and so on. Well, they were, to be honest, but so were we. That's how life was. Who they really were, were amazing people of trade and commerce and travel and government and all these good things as well. Great ship builders, weapon makers, city founders, <laughs> Dublin, Cork, Limerick, Wexford, Waterford, trade towns founded by the Vikings. Left eventually too, of course, but some stayed behind, married the Irish people, learned the Irish language, kept their art going too. This piece right here is one of those. Very nice piece. So now we'll go outside this door here as well. I'll open the door for you. The step is there with that eye. What's that please going forward? And at least lead the way there. If you want to go through there, please. Thank you very much. It won't take very long. Stand on that. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what that is for, I'll stand there. I'll prove it. <laughs> <laughs> what it's really for is off the water, off the rainwater, on it comes to the roof, into the gutter, down this chute, and across that pipe underneath comes out. That's all it is. So, uh, last year it was full of money. We were putting down money that was a holy well. It's not a holy well at all. Now, these it has some lip gloss and a few plates and some wristbands. So it's okay. So that's what it is. That's what we find. But again, to point out, this building here is a cathedral. The word means seat. That's built in later years. So the view was there of a plaza. Lantar is roughly somewhere there. The cross is in the museum now. was in the middle of that as well. This is all then later. It's called Gothic. It's a French style, really. It began around Paris, a place called Saint Denis, in the 1090s, around there. So it's different, though. It's got different arches. We have here rounded arches, very pretty, Romanesque. But the problem with rounded is that the stress pushing laterally, that way with it, go too high or too wide, it will fall in. This is different being Gothic, it's pointed like that, it's different stress, it's more vertical. You go higher with it. And the higher you go, the closer you shall be to God. It replaced Romanesque as a style then going forward. This archway here, in it, the tomb. The founder's tomb, we believe. Who was there was McCarthy. Still there, I doubt it. Maybe he was raided, but certainly he was placed there when he died in 1138. So 1134, this is completed. He's dead four years later. Upstairs, murdered by a rival. And buried in there, again, the patron, he's paying for this. They say a prayer for his soul every day. He's going to go to heaven for sure. He's guaranteed salvation. Over this door here, an animal is there too. A very, I suppose, bad light. But nonetheless, there is an animal here, thought to be a lion. The lion is there. And underneath the lion, a dragon or a snake, possibly here as well. The claws of the lion are in the snake, in the dragon. Is it, some say, Christianity, a brave, noble Christian lion conquering paganism in symbolism overhead the doorway here, but hunted by a half man, half beast. I know it's quite dull, but half man, half beast here with a, a bow and arrow and on his head an Anglo Norman's helmet. Is it the threat of invasion being repelled by the Christian church? In imagery as well, it's also said to, of course. We'll clear all of that. 
Any questions now, you want? Very well. Well, thank you for your visit. And when you pay for your visit here, you come in to you support our work here with these buildings too. So a bit of it is yours now. <laughs> so thanks for that. And I wish you all a Merry Christmas as well. And a Happy New Year.